What's up, guys? Welcome to Powerline Podcast. My name is Ryan Lucas. I'm your host. If you are a longtime listener, you know I love you. Thanks for joining in again. If it's your first time here, welcome. Hope you get some value from these episodes and from the content in here. I love bringing it to you. So this week's episode is number 107 with my good friend, Jimmy Moranis, all the way from New Zealand. Kiwi Lineman also goes by the handle New Zealand Lineman on Instagram. Fabulous guy. It's his second time on the podcast. And every time I talk to this guy, we get deeper and deeper on awesome subjects around line work, around mental health, around inside and outside the trade. So super stoked on this. Can't wait to get it to you. Let's just jump right in. Good to have you back on the show, dude. It's been too long. Yeah, I feel like we today. should. Uh, I feel like we should be doing this more often. I wouldn't mm. mind talk. I wouldn't mind talking to you more often. <laughs> yeah, well, it's exciting to be back on again and and to sort of uh, share, I suppose, what's happened between um, the last time and 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 now and and just to have a you know just to have a catch up and talk and that sort of stuff, eh? Heck yeah. Um, yeah. Let's let's give everyone a little bit of a rundown. I know you're on a previous episode, and I would suggest that mm-hmm. if anybody wants to go listen to your full story, um, go back and listen to the previous episode. So I guess over a year ago now. Hey, damn, yeah, damn yeah it's, it's, it's yeah. So uh, between now and then, so last time I talked to you, I was doing uh, I was working for a, a company called Mitre Consulting, which does a lot of training in New Zealand. So I, I was an a, a electrical trainer. I was doing uh, training line, uh, linemen up in, in their courses, but also doing uh, like live line hot glove and, and hot stick courses as well. And then uh, between between now and then, I've, I've, I've kind of left that, even though I still do a little bit for that company every now and then, even on Friday. I'm doing some examining for them for for a bunch of trainees that are coming up for their final exam, basically. Um, and in between then, I've me and a mate, me and a friend of mine have have started our own contracting business here in New Zealand, and we employ five people now, soon to be six. Good for you. Um, yeah, Wait, yeah. What, sort of, what what made you want to like? What made you want to dive into this and start your own? company i get this i get asked this question quite a bit and it's like honestly something i've been in wanting to do as well but the climate in bc like the work climate in in bc canada here is it's pretty competitive for small power line contracting companies as i imagine it probably is there as well so what what made you think of getting into this um it was it's something that i've the person and the person who, who I started this with, it's something him and I have always talked about, you know. So it's it's been in the back of my mind for probably ten years or so, you know, and but but it never really uh I suppose eventuated to anything up yeah. until up until last year and and we finally got our kind of like big break. So a lot of stuff had to happen for us to get to this point, you know, like um we we contract directly to a network owner um so the, the, the people who who own and uh, work on the power line so we get our work directly from them we have a basically a guaranteed contract with them and, and we just sort of help them out and um it's one of those things we me, me and hayden who's my business part, partner we were talking um i was busy obviously doing training and stuff and i just felt i was looking in the industry and um new zealand uh, at the moment it's going through a sort of a bit of a transition phase where I think it's a lot, it's happening a lot around the whole world. So a lot of linemen uh, are moving overseas, um, obviously for, for different types of opportunities, you know, more money or oh, interesting. that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, companies are losing staff. There's still a need to do a hell of a lot of work. You know, where are they going to find these, where are they going to find people to, to, to help them basically? And that that's sort of where, where we came in that's the, the the idea that we sort of came up with and we approached um the a person that we already knew uh for central lines which is the the local company that we're working for and we came up with this idea and and they were 
um, open open about it and we just sort of sold them and sold them on it and like I said we needed them to be on board obviously for this to come off the ground and and, and they've been nothing but helpful um, and yeah I mean I really thank them obviously for for for, for everything really yeah. it's so cool that you're able to be in that place to just be able to dive into something like this like so it's yeah. something that you and your buddy had talked about for a number of years and you both had the means and the finances and the time to say, okay, let's give this a try. Like, that's pretty, that's yeah. pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. How did yeah. it start? How did it start out? It was just you two and like one other guy? Three of us. So, uh, myself, Hayden, my business partner and my brother, my younger brother is also a lineman. So I remember that. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we started out just the three of us, um, and the funny thing is, like I said, I've had this idea in my head for a while, and I, I really think, you know, I don't, even, I don't, I don't fully believe in it, but you sort of talk things into existence a little bit, you know. So, 100. When I had this idea of starting this, I had this particular vehicle in mind, and it was a vehicle I, uh, I had worked in, had driven at a previous company that I've worked for about five or six, seven years ago. And I was like, oh, this would be the ideal, ideal vehicle to have. And we've got this um, site here in New Zealand, like kind of like, I suppose, eBay, but it's, it's called Trade Me. They sell vehicles and everything on there. And that vehicle popped up, you know, and I was like, oh, <laughs> snap. <laughs> One of the things, you know, it's, and, you know, it's, got, to, it's got to happen. So we, we bought that. So we bought that vehicle. We leased, uh, rented um, uh, like a, a bucket truck um, and we've got a crane truck which is a four drop truck which helps us put our poles and everything in and, and digs the holes and all that sort of stuff and that's how we started out and and a lot of it as well was a, I suppose a year prior um, I, I bought a stuff I bought a lot of stuff from eBay over in the States um, because it was just a lot cheaper than getting it here in New Zealand it was a lot of second hand stuff I bought um, extension sticks and so like tools uh, and stuff Hundred percent, yeah. And I would get it sent to an address in the states, and then, and then it would all come over in bulk, basically, you know. And so that was that was really good. So we'd sort of been like kind of like stocking up, I suppose, prior to starting. So that that made the the actual switch a little bit easier. And and then the next minute we were we were doing it. And that first month, first two months, is, is months is is kind of like the hardest because there's no income coming in. You know, because you, you get paid like monthly, and and yeah. everything is just going. Out. You got fuel bills, you got you got re like leases to pay, you got wages to pay, and but once you get sort of over that initial hump, you know, and and, and you, you pay off whatever you have, and I'm not saying it's plain sailing, but it becomes a little bit easier because other problems and which aren't problems, they're good problems to have, they pop up, and and that's the challenge, and that that's what I like, you know, the challenge. How how do you yeah. find? Um... Cause obviously you got to work as well. Right. Cause it's just, you, well, you got five, five or six guys now, but obviously you're still working. So how do you find yeah. managing the business side and the work side? Are you doing that? Okay. Or is it that what's becoming pretty difficult too? Well, listen, but that's why I've got a good business partner. So yeah. Hayden, he, he looks after, uh, more the financial side of, I'm, I'm a little bit involved, but he, he predominantly looks after that. He does the wages, you know, makes up our budgets and, and all that sort of stuff. I do more the day to day running of of with the guys, running the jobs, all that sort of stuff. And and you know, together I think we have quite a good good team and 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 you know, we work together um in, in other aspects of like, you know, when we're when we're looking to add a new one to the to the crew or whatever, you know. That's kind of what we do. Is it, it's a utility yeah. company that you're doing the work for? Yeah, so oh, that, that's the word I was. Yeah, yeah. So utility company Central Lines is is one of uh, twenty seven in New Zealand. So I mean, I know New Zealand is, is tiny compared to Canada, compared to to, to the states and stuff. But basically, uh, New Zealand's split up into twenty seven little areas which have their own utilities or, or power boards or networks. That's what we call them. They um, they own and manage the distribution um, side in in that area, you know. And, and Central Lines, the the one that we work for, is one of those. It's it's one of the like smaller ones, but has about I think it's about eighteen hundred kilometers of lines and about nine thousand customers, you know. So 
compared to you guys, it, it's tiny. But uh, uh, no, it's it's all it's all a big deal, though. That's that's good stuff. Do the, does this utility company manage all of your material then, like all of the, the poles yeah. and the hardware and all that kind of stuff? So yeah. they'll line out a, so, a project for you and make a package and yeah, cool. pretty much. So at the moment, we're, we're running quite a big. Uh, project which is uh, like it's, it's feeder 46 it's one of the feeders that that heads out it's it's about to get to the end is it's about an hour and a quarter an hour and a half's drive you know and um, there was about 80 to 90 poles to change on that there's about 300 400 sort of other items which include cross arms and stay wires sure. and all that sort of stuff it's quite a big project, and what makes it challenging is the the area that we work in is is rural, so it's it's country, but the ground conditions are very soft. Uh, we've had a, a quite a wet summer, quite a wet winter, so everything becomes quite a, a little bit of a challenge. We've got to get uh, diggers and track machines in to to, to get our poles in and 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 stood and all that sort of stuff. You know, talk about. Yeah. Um... Talk about exactly like where it is you're from and where you're working, like l- location, yeah. and kind of run through what what a day in the life looks like for a lineman in New Zealand in that area. Yep. Yeah, so uh, New Zealand, for for anyone that doesn't isn't familiar with it, is is basically two islands, the North and the South Island. Uh, we operate in the South Island. Uh, sorry, in the North Island. Uh, um, we're on the east coast, so it's on the um, the right hand side. Um, in a little sort of bay um, in the Hawke's Bay area. Um, and Hawk, the, the sort of east coast Hawke's Bay area has basically uh, three different utilities. Uh, like I said, Centrines is the one that we work for. And a day-to-day for us is basically we, we sort of start at 7.30. Um, if we haven't uh, planned our day prior, you know, we, we look at what what's coming up. We're, we're sort of at the moment running two shutdowns a week so it's a that's on a tuesday and a thursday so that's uh, like an area outage um and then on the monday wednesday and friday we're pre- like prepping everything so we have these uh, multiple multi-gang um shutdowns where it might be we might be changing say 10 poles four five six cross arms all that sort of stuff you know and we sort of we spend our time prepping all that stuff up we've got work to do as well in those shutdowns as well as as the the crews from Central Lines and and that's you know challenging as well. Do you guys do most of your work yeah. de de energized versus energized? We do. So yeah, on 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 the Central Lines network, um, there's a lot of uh, de energized stuff. Uh, although I did some live line uh, 11 kV glove, hot glove a couple of weeks ago. We did a couple of pole changes, arm changes, but at the moment um, there is a lot of de-energized stuff that gets done um they do put a lot of temporary links in so stuff to minimize the shutdown area oh, you know okay. that that, that well, yeah they don't just, do you know what i mean by like uh, yeah 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 like hot gloves. Like, uh, yeah yeah so that we, we do a lot of that yeah. yeah the rubber gloves is what the they call them rubber gloves hot gloves same yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, like there's a lot of um 11 kv here Okay, um, and then obviously, thirty three kV is is um, the other sort of voltage that we use, and yeah. What transmission voltages do you guys yeah. use? Um, one ten, two twenty. Um, there's sort of like this sub transmission, which is like fifty and sixty six kV, yep. which some networks have. It hasn't. It isn't really here, but um, the the transmission. Uh, part is is run by Transpower, who, who's owned by the government, and and they they basically uh, look after that part and 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 feed it into the towns where where you know the networks basically look after all the distribution and and the poles and wires and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think every I think every lineman, well, every lineman I've ever talked to has definitely had the idea in his head at one point in time that I should start a power line company because <laughs> they get fed up working for people or they just think that they could do it better or wh- whatever right the scenario is is it something yet so, so far i know it's fairly fresh for you but is it something that you'd say that you'd recommend giving it a try like is it you happy with it so far yeah 
hell yeah, if you if you get the opportunity to do something, do it. Like especially if you can do something that is yours, you know, like you can you can put your own stamp on and with that comes obviously, you know, you're gonna make decisions and sometimes those decision decisions might not necessarily I'm not gonna say the wrong ones, but got to think about the choices you make because they don't just affect you now you're you're responsible for for the people underneath you and making sure that they get paid and they go home safe and and so that's 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 you know another part of it you know like when when yeah when you have people working for you that uh thing of okay you know make sh- making sure that the work's always there and making sure they're happy and and safe and and yeah. and all that sort of stuff you know yeah. It seems like you're scaling, you're scaling already. Um, do, you, do you have plans to scale even further? Is there the capacity for that? Like what's your, your plans for growth? Uh, look, we want to grow. I, I think that's with anything. I think you don't want to, um, you don't want to get stale or anything, you know? So I'd love to grow. The opportunity obviously has to be there. And I, I think that if we keep working hard and, and we keep showing that that um, what we bring to the table is valuable, you know, um, that those opportunities will come, you know, they, they definitely will. And and our team, you know, we, we've got a really good team. We, you know, we, we, we've hired um, some really good guys with, with a lot of um, different experiences and different backgrounds and 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 that's been really good too because um the my brother my brother has recently left he's going to go and pursue some opportunities in australia okay. so um we've had to uh, hire uh, three new guys basically over a space of like a couple of months and as you know like trying to i mean there's a whole bunch of new people trying to get everyone sort of you know what their roles are and yeah. and how that all works everyone getting to know each other and you know this guy works like this and he doesn't like this or you know that sort of stuff and that's cool i like that you know yeah, yeah. how have you found uh, how have you found like the leadership role um you've always kind of been you've always been a leader and always been yeah. kind of a leadership role is this something new for you this role is there new aspects to to this there's just saying. there is yeah there is but only a little bit so i actually thought about this probably about a month ago. I don't think I've changed. Well, I don't think I've changed, but maybe someone else might say I have, but I don't think I've changed because I feel that in, in my previous roles and, and working for other companies, I always had a uh, a bit of ownership and always felt like, well, I always treated like it was my own business almost, you know, like that's the effort that I would put into someone right. uh, into, into working. And that was also sometimes part of the, frustration is that you you sort of you do you put all this effort in sometimes and, and sometimes it doesn't get seen especially if you're working for say like a big corporate or something where you're just a hey i'm very you know and it's it's more about numbers on a sheet than what 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 a person or a group is doing you know yeah. what's uh i got a i got a question i wrote this question down because it sounds like a bit of a crafted question because it is but i'm interested in your perspective on it um, what is a practical way for a leader to not use fear, but still motivate their team? So to not use fear, but still be able to motivate your team. I think that motivation, the way I do it, and I'm, I'm not saying that, that I'm a great leader or anything like that. Everyone leads in, 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 <laughs> in their own in their own way but i first and foremost a, a leader needs to be the person that is at the forefront of something so if people see that you're willing to do something or you're willing to go the extra mile 90 percent of the time they'll follow you you know but it takes a little bit the start a little bit of extra effort you know especially with some people who come from from different places and and part of that is also when people are doing a good job is is say to them you know I'm, I'm you know really proud of you today awesome effort you know maybe when we're finished we'll, we'll go down and have a have a beer and I, I might put on some food and 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 that's all part of it and and making sure that that anything that's good doesn't get forgotten about and and doesn't go un, unrecognized you know because 
being with fear, yeah, I think works in the short term, but in the long term, you get a lot of resentment and, and people grow grow old. You know, they don't, it doesn't work in the long run. You know? So you got to be, you got to be open and you got to sometimes have those conversations that are a bit like, but they mean a lot to that person sometimes, you know, like, hey, you know, awesome today, you know, whatever it is, you know, and and just reward reward the guys, you know, reward them. And, and it could be in different forms. It might be on site, putting a barbecue on and, and putting some meat on there and, you know, whatever, whatever that is, you know, that they'll appreciate it, you know. So but that, that's, that's how I sort of do it, yeah. Bad leadership is so obvious I, mm. it's it seems so obvious to me but i guess it's maybe not to some other people because there's lots of bad leaders out there that just continue to operate mm. um but it seems like it's just it's so obvious it, i always kind of said as a leader um you need to like you work for your em- employees or subordinates or whatever you want to call the people that are yeah. that are working for you but you are it's the opposite yeah. you're actually working for them um, what's your perspective on, um, al- allowing, uh, your team below you, like giving them a set of like, say, uh, orders or not even orders, just giving them a task, a job project yeah. and, uh, al- allowing them to do their thing. How much do you intervene? How much do you hold back? How much do you, you know, are you a helicopter type leader or, or do you just allow them to f- potentially fail and then coach them through it what's your perspective on that but at the moment i would be a hands-on only because we've got a bunch of new guys and sure. we we we're and because i said like new zealand's broken up into 27 different power boards those 27 different power boards yeah have have different ways of doing stuff different standards and and so at the moment yeah that's a I'm, lot for a small place yeah yeah it is and and every different rules different ways of doing things sure. you know it, it's it's too many like i don't understand why we can't just have this is the one one you know and this is how we do it these are the rules uh, you know but yeah so at the moment i'm a little bit more hands-on only because i kind of have to be and it's not that i don't trust the guys it's more um letting them know hey look this is the way we do it over here this is what they expect of us but but, but gradually I'll, I'll pull back. So even say today, I finished a little bit early. The boys are still out there um, doing the work and it's a gradual process. And, and it's not like I wouldn't feel comfortable with a new crew going like, here you go, you guys sort it out. And then sure. two days later when we come and do the work, oh, why is this all, you know, this is not how, it, I'd rather, it's a gradual process. It's a gradual trust process. And I've, I, you know, at the same time, I have full faith that the guys will always do the right thing. It just might not be at the moment um, the right way of doing it sometimes, you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very aligned with what you said uh, your leadership style is as well. You know, you are you seem like a lead from the front type of person. Mm. And then once you see that your team is like, you know, maybe up to... Uh, giving them a task and then trying them at something. Yeah. And yeah, like you yeah, said, yeah, yeah. a slow roll into that and then peel back a little bit and yeah. let them, yeah. you know, thrive or fail and then be there to pick them up yeah. or coach them through. Yeah, that's cool. And, and there will be failures. And, and that's another part of it. Like, mm-hmm. are you the type of person that's going to come down and, you know, uh, it's everyone else's fault and stuff? You know, I, I've, I always look at it this way you, you, you succeed together. And, and you fail together, you know. So a, a failure is never on, on, say, like one person because winning is never on one person. It's, it's, it's It all goes together, yeah. you know. And it, it would be unfair to, to, to trust people and they don't quite do the right thing and then sort of, you know, they're still going to, they're still going to obviously be repercussions of some sort, but not, yeah, not some of the stuff that I've, I've, I've had in the past, let's put it that way, you know, mm-hmm. and that's the other thing is, is I put myself, well, I try to put myself in, in, in their shoes or in other people's shoes. How do I, how would I receive this or how I, how would I want this to be done or whatever, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, what's your experience so far then with like crew dynamics? 
Um, have you had some sticky situations to work through and how do you approach working through those? Um, um, it's where we are at the moment, like with, with power lines, Hawke's Bay, the, the company that, that we started, not so much. We've had people obviously, um, come and go. So, um, that sometimes that's been a bit of a learning thing because it's the first time I've obviously run my own company. So part of my learning was not to take that personally, like someone's leaving you to not, it's, it's a, you know, they're leaving the company, you know, you know what I mean? Like to not sort of hold that against someone that oh, I've left companies in the past, you know? So yeah. when you leave, when that person's it's leaving, different when you're in the leaving. other, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's my brother leaving, you know, as well. Like that was a little bit um, out of left field. And again, you got to sort of you got to take the personal side out of it and understand that it's not a person. They're not leaving you, or they're not saying that you're bad. It, it, it might be that the person's got another opportunity, or they want to go a different way, or whatever it is, you know. And and that's the other thing with us is like with power lines, Hawks Bay. We've had a few people come through and it's been more like a, we've had a, you know, with us, you can sort of come and work with us for three or four months and it's no, it's no big deal. You can, you know, you can leave again. Um, whereas with, with a, with a bigger company, you know, they sort of, when you sign on, they expect you to sign on for oh, uh, nice, few yeah. years and stuff. Huh. Yeah, so that's always a challenge. And it's been good. Like, cause in New Zealand, I've got a lot of connections. So it's the second I, I, we might have a person leave or we might have a person that, that's going on holiday. I'll, I'll sort of ring around and go, hey, you know, do you want to come in for a couple of months or a month or whatever? And Emily, who you had on your podcast, yeah, um, she came, worked for us for, for about six weeks as well and really awesome. helped us out. And Yeah, so she flew in from Australia because she's in Australia at the moment okay. working. Um, she was sort of in between. She was doing some training to, to sort of get on the network over there and, uh, a big cyclone happened um, basically here in Hawke's Bay where a lot of poles and wires and people got flooded. And so um, we asked, uh, we sort of came together and, and she was heading back to New Zealand at the same time as at the same time we were, we were looking for someone to give us a hand and, and she came out and, and gave us a hand for six weeks and that went really well. And, but yeah, at the moment, power lines Hawke's Bay to, to have any real conflict there hasn't been any conflict and that's because i think we've we've hired like-minded people and and at the moment you know so so far so good uh in the past like and other places i've worked you know i think growing up in the industry yeah, there's been times when when you've butted heads with people and and had different views and and all sorts you know yeah and um that's all part of learning yeah 100 percent, 100 percent part of learning yeah and yeah. You you got to be able to. I I talked about this with uh, with Ben. Um, failing is just part of it. It's part of life. It's part of the yeah. job. It's part of life. Yeah. It, yeah. And you can't get too hung up on um, taking it too personal if you fail. Like mm. and that you know, there's a classic example of Alexander Graham Bell failing to make the light bulb like thousands of times mm. before he finally made it. Right. I know we just kind of like throw yeah. that out there, like, but it's true, man. Like, um, yeah. I heard, uh, Alex Hermosi talk about this recently. Um, he said that there's just a lack of understanding in the world today about how many times, like how many repetitions it takes to get good at something. Like when you hear that 10,000 hour rule or, you know, yeah. do that thing 10,000 times before you even get close to perfecting it. There's truth in that. Yeah. And he used it from the context of like posting content. He's like, I had 400 podcast episodes before we even went anywhere near the top 100, you know, and yeah. like, people just don't even realize what that takes. <laughs> um, yeah. so same sort of thing. Like you gotta be able to fail or maybe it's not even a failure. Maybe you're just not doing enough volume of it. It's just a volume yeah. game. Yeah. It's interesting. But the other thing is people forget that you learn from, from, from failing like allow yourself to fail safely especially in our job yeah. um but you learn a lot from it like mm -hmm. okay now i know not to do it like that or 
if that if I do it like this, this is the outcome, you know. And if you don't have that failure, and 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 you know, there's guys I've met guys in the past that say oh, I've never had a incident or an accident or anything like that. And I'm not saying that that there's that I push the part like push the parcel or anything like that. But I think I think it's quite uh, if you've been in the industry long enough, you, you're going to have stuff sometimes go wrong, and you just hope that that you're wearing all the right stuff, the PPE, and you're doing the right thing with the right intentions, and that, yeah, if something fails for whatever reason, but it fails safely, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the main... That's uh, the, the type of approach to safety that, that Quanta has adopted. Uh, Quanta and its lead safety uh, guy, Matt Comfer, came up with this uh, capacity model. And the model is basically that, which you talk about. It's like leaving yourself the capacity to fail. It, so when you're doing all your checks and balances, it's, it's like, not that, uh, if an accident will happen, it's when it will happen. So when it does happen, have you built in the capacity to fail safe? Mm. Right. And, uh, also I love, I love that because it's like, it, it's a way better, uh, approach than the like zero incidents approach, right? Like mm. Zero incidents is just like I don't know. It's some great term some exec came up with at some point in time that makes no sense because it actually being able to happen is slim to none. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I know. Like myself, when I started out in the industry, and I, and I see a lot of uh, young guys and 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 young women coming in the industry now, and they get so hung up on 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 stuff oh, i can't do this or i tried this and it didn't work and oh, well i think everyone's been in that position man i, I remember the first time you know i climbed the pole and i, was, I had to lean out and because i didn't know where to put my belt and it was it was really hard and you know and and the first time you have to use new tools and equipment and and you know it really does it does it work by itself straight away it, it takes time and 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 it takes um like you said repetition and stuff and that ten thousand hours i'm a i'm a firm believer in it because i think there's a there comes a time in your career and and i sort of i always think it's it's around that sort of everyone's different but it's around that eight to ten year mark where you become alignment that's yeah. really really self-sufficient you might think you're you're at that point yeah. two or three years in you know, and I, yeah. I have this this thing of like, this is the way I kind of look at it. You know, and and, and obviously there's diff- different guys with different experience and, and different ages that come in, but it, it's it's all kind of relative. Like when you kind of first start, you, you're kind of like a baby. You don't know anything. You got to be spoon fed. You know, you got to yeah. be shown how to put gear on and everything like that. And that stage lasts for however long, and then you get a little bit of little bit of understanding and you become like a toddler you know like they don't like to be told and then later on teenager and that's really sort of when you get qualified and i'm proof i know everything i want to un, you know i know how to do it and that's the to me that part there that teenager part the part where you've sort of just been qualified that's in your career is one when you learn the most but it's also the most dangerous because your crew is not really watching over you anymore mm-hmm. you know you're sort of being given a little bit more responsibility maybe they might be throwing you into a leadership role you don't want to disappoint the person that's given you the opportunity so you don't want to seem like a person that doesn't know what they're doing so you won't ask yeah. you know so i know this stuff because i've 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 100 percent been through it, you know, and then it takes a few years, and you'll sort of become a bit of an adult, and that's sort of that eight to ten years, and you're home and hosed, hopefully, and hopefully you've you've had some good experiences, and and you can share those with the with the next generation that's coming on if they're willing to listen. It's sheer volume, yeah. right? Like it, it's so true, though. Like it's volume in whatever the application is, or whatever the discipline is that you're trying to do, whether it's line work or whether it's anything in life, is People just completely underestimate the amount of volume it takes to get good at something. It's any Olympian, any professional athletes, it's very rare that you end up just being the, the the Michael Jordan or the Wayne Gretzky or something like that of your sport. But even them, they put in more work than anybody in history. When you get down to the 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 backbone of it, they did more to Kobe. Yeah. Like they did hours oh, yeah. upon hours upon hours. Like Col- Kobe did 
yeah. triple or quadruple the amount of hours in his discipline, in his sport to get to the top of the game. And like, people just don't understand that. They expect to be just good at it right out, right out the gate. And you're hundred percent right with what you said. It's, it's a volume yeah. thing. It's a, it's a good analogy that one with Kobe Bryant, because he would, you know, you hear those stories with him where, where his teammates would, would come into the gym and he's kind of like, he's leaving, like he's already done his workout and he's getting ready for his next workout and, and so on. And, I think throughout his career, he had he had real problems sometimes with with teammates who didn't share the same yeah. uh, work ethic as him. You know, like he's pushing his, himself to the next level, so his team you know gets better. And, and there's obviously other players and stuff on on his team who, who are just willing to do the the minimum basically to be there. You know, and that yeah. again, that's you know that's kind of like a you know as a leader, you know, you going yeah. going above and beyond. But yeah, he was. I- I can't remember how exactly how it went, how he was describing it, but he would describe like, okay, so, you know, your teammates come in and there's one practice a day and they come in for three, yeah. four, hours, four hours and, and practice. He's like, meanwhile, I got up at four in the morning. I practiced for two or three hours. I had like a little lunch or whatever and rested and then went to practice again and then went to practice again in the evening. He's like, I just did three days yeah. worth in your one day. He's like, I got three times the amount of time invested. And yeah. People don't necessarily want to do that to this job, but the people who really succeed, and I've seen this firsthand because my father was this way. My dad used yeah. to come home and invest extra hours at the end of the day into reading books. Like he'd pick up every book that he could yeah. about, about like boring topics like regulators and transformers and substations and yeah. like learning about the craft basic electricity yeah. and physics and and this is what he would sit in bed and read at night like i remember him doing it and that's what yeah. made him better and that's what set him apart and i don't know i feel like people today don't want to invest that sort of time they just you know show up to their yeah. job show up to their job and it's like, ah, I already did my eight hours or my 10 hours. I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm done with this. I don't want to do any more of this, but you know, yeah. it's what you got to do. Sometimes. I can definitely, <laughs> yeah, I can definitely see that, you know, like people are, um, well, we're in that, we're in that time of sort of like instant, instant gratification. You know, if it doesn't work or whatever, move on to the next thing. You know, you, you think about the appliances and stuff that we have in our homes you know, like TVs and toasters, whatever. It breaks, so we just go down the shop and, and get a new one. But, you know, back in the day, you'd take it to a TV repairman or something and get it fixed. And, you know, it, uh, it's part and parcel, I think, of, of, of yeah, today's today's thing. With, with Especially with young people, you know, coming in and expecting that from day dot that they know, they'll know everything. And, and, and you know, like I, I always say to everyone, it's, it's just going to take time. You know, and there's going to be times like, like we said, there's going to be times when you fail, and there's going to be times when, when you'll have egg on your face. And but those are the, the cherish those moments because you're going to learn the most out of that. You know, the person who has no failures or or um, anything in their career, what do they really know? They only know how to do that that way. You know, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, it's all part. Of going, yeah, it's it's crazy because. I feel like we've been told or kids or young people or whatever have been told recently that these jobs don't matter, you know, like these basic, the trades, the skilled trades. Like I'm, I'm like, bring, bring back craft labor again, like bring back craftsmanship again, bring back skilled trades again, because they've been told that all of these jobs are, you're never going to get good pay. They're, you know, blue collar it's it's got a bad connotation around it and you don't want to be that you want to be a doctor you want to be a lawyer you want to be whatever in media here i am in media we're like talking like this but i think that it's leading down a bad path because yeah if we don't have the people to build the shit (laughs) like we're screwed if something and you saw this during covid when the world shuts down I myself in this industry, I didn't skip a beat, not a beat. No, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know a lineman that missed more than three days, you know, yeah. in two and a half, three years, if anything, we, we excelled 
because we're valuable. Yeah. We're needed. It's, it's a, like, it's a skill that when the power goes out, like you're screwed. Yeah. Like you need somebody to fix that. Yeah. And regular people, like a TikTok star doesn't know how to fix the power line. Right. I'm sorry. If a TikTok star doesn't know how to fix your car, unless that's what they do on TikTok, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's facts, man. I, I don't know. You're hundred percent right. And I don't know what the situation is in the States and, and in Canada, but here in New Zealand and Australia, man, like linemen are in, in massive demand now. And, and that comes from like my generation. So I'm turning 40 this year. Um, when I was getting trained or maybe the 10 years sort of prior to that, it was like no training being done, you know, and that it's very, I don't very often see line mechanic or linemen that are my age, you know, so there's a huge gap between like really old guys that are about ready to retire and then really young dudes, you know, and then there's sort of middle, the middle guys that are sort of like 40, you know, 34, you know, late 30s to 40s, 45. They're just not around. They're sort of like, they don't exist almost, you know. So, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if that's the same the world over, but there's definitely a huge, huge um, shortage of not just linemen, linemen, but like skilled trades, you know, like like what you're talking about, you know. But in particular, because I know our industry, mm -hmm. it's massive, you know. You just can't, you can't get anyone. So in New Zealand, a lot of the companies at the moment are hiring guys from overseas, a lot of um, guys from the Philippines, a lot of guys from the uh, Pacific Islands, South Africa uh, are coming into New Zealand and getting trained up and, and, and they may not necessarily have been linemen before, but they would have been in the electrical industry as, as, as you know, as, as a uh, electrician or whatever. Yeah. And they're getting retrained basically and then coming line because there's, there's no one around. And, it, and that comes no, with its own, own that comes with its own oh, set of challenges as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. It's only a stop, you know, it's only a stop gap for now because these guys, and I've, I've, you know, it's, it's a, it, it's a luck of the draw. So some guys are really, really good and onto it and they're, and they're their eyes are open and, and willing to learn and, and other guys because they haven't got the background in it I find it really challenging you know like yeah it's all cool you were, you were an electrician or, or something before and they may have worked in like a, a, a mine so they're used to like doing this type of work and when you get them out and they finally have to go up a pole and, and pull wires up and, and that's when it all comes out and it's, like, yeah. it's not as easy as what you thought it was and you deal you, you, and then you start to add it's a very dangerous job. It just is. It's fact. And then you start to add yeah. layers of complexity, like language barriers and, you know, yeah. um, where you came from, tradition, like culture, like all of that plays into like now making it even extra challenging just to set poles yeah. and transfer wire. <laughs> and yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's exactly like you said, yeah, United States, especially, um, Lyman, very high demand, like, uh, Quanta Quanta services who I'm working for, like 50,000 people work for that company. Um, there's probably around 30,000 outside versus 30, you know, 20,000 inside supporting staff. Um, so that's, that's a lot of like boots on the ground workers and there's, they're talking thousands of linemen short, um, uh, and not just linemen. Wow. They're really into a bunch of a bunch of the skilled trades, like all of the skilled trades. Yeah. Um, yeah. They need mechanics, heavy duty mechanics, operators. You know, um, the full spectrum of skilled trades and very very high demand right now. They can't you, you can't produce um, a tradesman fast enough because it yeah. it really does play into like just what you what you just said. A few moments ago, how it takes 10 years, that's facts, man. It takes 10 years to get to a spot where you're like, okay, I'm kind of, I'm comfortable here now. Like I, I know my job, I know what's coming up. I know like, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems or issues or things you're still going to learn, but you got a really good grasp on what's going on. But that's 10 years. You're not making, you're not making that tomorrow, but they need it tomorrow. They needed it yesterday. Oh, yeah. 
So like they're in a, yeah. they're in a pickle right now at the whole world is, you know, we haven't done a good yeah. job at promoting the trades period. No, no. I hope that changes in, in, in time to come, you know, like I think a lot more people are waking up to it as well. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and looking around and going, you know, I've got friends that went to, to, to university college, you know, and, and, and got degrees and, most of them don't use those degrees, you know, like, so they've spent an extra three, four, five years, got a massive loan and, 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 and did whatever subjects they did. But in the end, they don't, they're not even using that for the job that they're actually doing, you know, like, and it's, I think that it, it starts at a, at a school level almost, you know, that you can identify people who are a bit more hands-on and people that are a bit more academic and, and promote promote that stuff you know and, and we will probably wouldn't be in the position sometimes that we're in you know it's it's another issue that um is a problem right now is retention um mm. so actually curious on your perspective on this like when you have a good leader or you have somebody that you've you know been bringing up in the company or just bringing up under your wing say it's even an apprentice that's been coming up under your wing and um like you really want to hold on to that person. I know they get their own things, their own goals, their own ambitions, but it is, it, retention is a problem right now. And I, I don't know that it has like a one word answer or a one sentence or paragraph answer on how you keep people around, but quality leadership, um, keeping quality leadership around is an issue these days as well. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on how you would try to keep quality leadership around? To, awesome. to me, you know, I, I was talking to someone again about this not that long ago as well. So to me, that job starts, say, from a management point of view, years prior, you know, because a person will decide to leave over a period of time. And it might be for a number of different reasons. It could be that they're looking for a new opportunity. It could be that they, for whatever reason. But that retention process doesn't start when that person is telling you they want to leave. That retention process should be saying that that should be ongoing for their whole time with whatever company they're working for. Mm -hmm. You know, good leaders, good people, um, you want to try and, and, and keep a hold of. So they're always going to be in demand, you know. And I think we sort of, in the past, sort of put our head in the sand and gone, oh, these people won't leave and, and all of a sudden they do. And then when they do, there's like, oh, we'll chuck you an extra $2 or what can we do? to? Well, by that stage, that person's already made their mind up, you know, and yeah. sometimes you can talk, but it's already there. So the, the, the retention part should start prior. So... Why do most people want to leave? You know, sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's to make more money. Sometimes it's it's to get more responsibility. You know, to get more training to advance. And so, I think that the thing is to have those conversations with your employees, with with those people that you work with. And can we finish this part now? You know, where do you where where do you see yourself going? What what do you think you can bring to the table? Or where do you think your skills? You know, where can they? What can we do basically to to so you are even more of an asset to us, you know, like, and there could be, could, could be training, could be extra responsibility, which leads into extra money anyway, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. But I think, it, and I'm only speaking for the companies that I've left in the past, that what I see happening around me, it, it's, it's, it's pro, it, you should be proactive rather than reactive to something, you know. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is part and parcel is people will leave. You know, people are going to leave. And if they're a good worker, treat them well when they're leaving. Don't make it like a personal issue, you know, like, because that sticks with someone. And 100%. ultimately, you want that person to come back. Yeah, you want that person to come back. And if they do come back, and they've been gone for two or three or four years, however long they've been gone, they've had this all this other experience which they can bring back to your company. And and be like, hey, look, this this place does it like this, or this this brings this, and so this there's there's all this other stuff, this good stuff, which can potentially happen when a person leaves, you know, as well. You're 100 yeah. percent right. With I, I love that because with all of the with with social media, um, people have 
people underestimate the power of word of mouth marketing. And that also works the same in reverse, right? So if you're like giving that person exiting your company a negative experience as they exit the company, or maybe it was, you know, a negative experience that made them leave in the first place, they leave yeah. that marketing isn't good marketing when they go out that word of mouth marketing, like, and you don't know who that person is going to end up talking to and share Like maybe the person that they were, they go to talk to next and share, Hey, that's a shit company. You don't want to work for them. They did this, this, and this. And that person that was thinking of going to your company could have been your next top star and you had no idea. And you just yeah. missed that opportunity. Like, I know those are hypotheticals, but those are real. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. That's the way I sort of, that's, that's the, the thought process I, I take into, to what we do, you know, like the people that have left us, um, and they've left knowing that they were going to be short term and all that sort of stuff. But I've, I keep in contact with them and, and make sure that when they leave it, I thank them or we thank them. You know, we normally have a, we put on some food, we have some, you know, some couple of beers and, you know, it's part of that whole leaving experience. You make that experience as positive as it is, even though sometimes you don't want that person to leave and it, it can be shit if a person leaves, but hopefully you, if you do it in a right way, that person comes back and, and they come back a better person anyway, you know, and, and company grows from there as well, you know, and, and that word of mouth thing is, is massive, you know, like that's basically how we've got most of our guys is, is word of mouth. And I might put an adver advertisement up or whatever, but it's actually, it's more word of mouth that, that that's how we get our guys, you know, like, um, this person comes and works for us. Hey, we're looking for another line mechanic. Do you know anyone? I know this dude, you know, be great, you know. That's so, and that's that's ideal. That's what you want. I don't want to spend uh, thousands of dollars on advertising if I, if you don't have to. I'd rather someone who knows someone and they know that person's good. You've got two things there because the person that's recommending that person has got a bit of skin in the game because they're not going to recommend someone that's yeah. that's you know because they're going to work with that person. You know, so. That, that's that's you know and, and the other thing is if you if you know that that person is recommending your company you're kind of like oh we're doing the right thing here you know like you can sort of be like oh. otherwise that person wouldn't recommend someone to come here totally so yeah, yeah. It's, it's skin in the game plus it's a it's a nice little uh vetting process because that person if especially if you trust that person and that's a that's a that's a great opinion or um it's a piece of the interview that's already done, so to speak. Cause yeah. you know, somebody's recommending you could ask that person, hey, how's this you know, I like that. Like yeah. That. um Yeah. I've been asking people and talking a lot about and you've probably seen this, talking a lot about mental health lately. Yeah. Um so curious your perspective, what you're seeing, you know, in another country, halfway around the world, other side of the world. Um, it's a big issue over here. I'm, I was like, not necessarily going to call it an issue. It's just something it's been labeled mental health and marketed as mental health. And I like the way I forget where I heard this first, but I heard it said mental fitness or called mental fitness. And I really liked that terminology for it because it made it seem like it's something you got to work on every day, no matter, just like going to the gym, you work on your physical fitness, same sort of thing. You work on your mental fitness. So maybe that's a twofold question. What do you see in your side of the world as far as this subject goes? Yeah. And like, give some tools, trips, tips, takeaways yeah. um, from the mental health space, things you do. See. So mental health. So I think that we're, we're slowly starting to get a bit more, um, I suppose, recognition. And, and, and people have got to obviously a name to give certain things that are happening and you know whether it's depression or, or all that sort of stuff and it's important and especially as males um you know uh, depression goes almost hand in hand sometimes with with going down a deep dark hole into like, like almost suicide so and in, in, in new zealand the the mental health part um the statistics aren't great and i don't think they're great you know, anywhere, especially for males and, and heading down that, that path. So I'm glad um, that there's a little bit more, but that 
a little bit more openness, at least. We're starting to, starting to sometimes have those conversations. We're still not doing it enough, but we're starting to have those conversations sometimes. And and I think, you know, as you go through life, um, everyone will have man, woman, will have some sort of mental health problems at some point. Someone will have, a, some people will have it a little bit more than others, a little bit more extreme than others. But I'm pretty sure in today's age, Everyone's going to have, at some point, you know, low points or a low point that they have to sort of get themselves selves out of, you know. And part of that is the tools. And, and I think as you grow older, hopefully, you sort of figure out kind of what works for you and kind of sometimes what can be the trigger points, you know. Like, I know for me personally, um, I remember when I worked overseas, uh, I worked in... in Scotland at the time and a big one for me is is if I don't have a lot of interaction with people you know like over a, over an extended period of time you sort of get in your thoughts and it's very hard to get out of it and 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 for me it's talking about stuff so w- whatever leads to that you know you might have broken up with a, with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or, or have whatever and at that point in time it might seem like this is all doom and gloom you know but I look at it as um, like a like a like a soda coke bottle, you know. You fizz it up. That's like your it could be your depression or, or your anxiety or whatever. And every conversation you have is it's like taking that top off and just letting the fizz out just a little bit because sometimes all it is is just you just talk and it, and then you sit back and go oh, actually you sort of listen to yourself talk and actually it's not actually such a big issue. You know, like, I can get through this or whatever. But it's the times when you don't talk and you and you brew it up and and, it, and, and stuff heaps onto other stuff. And, and and that's where us as as, as males, as men, yeah, I think that's just part and parcel of, of how we're wired. You know, we're, we're sort of the tough guy, you know, the guy that takes it on the chin, that, that keeps going, especially the working the working man, the, the working male that, Got to keep going, man. Got to got to pay the bills. Got to get keep the money coming in, and and he might be having a fight with his wife at home, or it's not going right with his kids, or his, whatever it is, you know. And 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 I just 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 take some time sometimes, and 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 just talk, and and or talk to someone, talk to someone you can trust. And I think most most companies nowadays have have programs where you can call anonymously. And just have that talk to that person. I'm not saying that that's that's the magic cure, but it's the it's the road, hopefully, mm-hmm. to that. And the other thing is is um, I heard I heard this somewhere as well. And and exercise is a big big thing. You know, it, it releases a lot of endorphins, and you might feel like shit, or you know, again, whatever set you off, and and you. You go and do something. It could be going for a walk out, walking your dog or something like that. And after that, oh, and actually I feel a little bit better now, you know. And just, yeah. That, that's how I look at it, you know. Uh, mental health, hell of a lot more can be done about it, you know. We should not we should be taught, you know, or we, it should become acceptable that, that you should be able to share your emotions and, and feelings and all that sort of stuff. And I think we just come, we're just coming out of a generation that is, that is also, or generations, that have been through a lot. You think about what what our previous uh, forefathers went through with World War One, World War Two, depressions, and all that sort of stuff. They've seen a hell of a lot of stuff, you know, mm. c- compared to us, you know. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just it's just getting talking and, and, and working your way through that. Hopefully, that, that's how I look at it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I think you're very much onto something with that. I like that analogy of the Coke bottle and the fizz. Um, because I think you're totally right. I think a lot of it can be managed, you know, not say not to downgrade this and say simply, but uh, much more easily managed just through simple conversations on the on the daily. But and that plays into that that fitness um, perspective mm-hmm. versus just the mental health is like it's it's your fitness you're working on your, your development. Like yeah. Um, the tools are available out there. They're probably never more available today than any other 
time in the history of time. <laughs> like you just mentioned, you know, our, our fathers even, or our father's fathers, like, look at the shit they had to come through and kept that all bottled inside and didn't have the tools or didn't have access to the tools. I know it's hard. Mm-hmm. It, it Maybe it's harder to filter through what tools are good and what tools are bad now because there's so much content out there, but at least you're getting access to seeing some of these types of content. So, um, and, and access to these people and these systems and processes and things that can help you get better and, and get stronger mentally. Yeah, that's a good point. One of the biggest outlets I've always had is this job. You know, this job is, has always been, um, kind of like my safe space. If you know, you know, like, yeah, I, I, like we've talked about, I mean, I've had incidents and accidents and all that sort of stuff in the job, but the job has always been my, like the, 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 the thing that's always been me. You know, I can always, mm. I always find challenges. I can, I can, um, if I want to, you can do, do your job really physically hard if you want to. So there's a, there's a way of, of getting your energy out. And, and yeah, I feel I've always been blessed with, with having good, teammates people around me that i trust and and that you can talk to and and all that sort of stuff because at the end of the day we're all going through the same stuff you know maybe not at that moment but this person has maybe been you've been you know maybe not the exact same way but the same sort of thought process so I'm just, yeah for me I've been lucky enough that this job has always been been there and and you know going through like i said like could be going through a breakup with your with your missus or with, with, with your girlfriend or whatever. But this job's always been here for me, you know. Mm-hmm. And 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 the support work, you know, wherever I've worked has always been there, you know. So that that's quite cool. That's that's good. That's awesome to hear because I hear a lot of feedback sometimes on social saying uh, the brotherhood is dead, you know, and the, you don't mm-hmm. linemen don't know what I, I've got this recently from a few guys and one guy in particular the linemen don't know what true brotherhood is like true brotherhood comes from suffering is obviously a a vet that has gone through some suffering and i'm sure it's like i'm sure he's gone through some shit and i feel bad for him and but yeah i still believe that you can develop a real brotherhood slash sisterhood whatever you want to call it um in this trade and i don't think it's dead it's the best people I know on this earth that come from this industry or one step away from it. Um, so yeah, I, I believe you're hundred percent right with that. One thing that like this job has also done the same for me. And I know I'm not on the tools every day, but I'm still in the industry. I'm still talking to the people and, and there's just good, good people in this industry. There's good people everywhere, but there's good people in this trade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. For some of the young guys, coming into this, coming into this industry, uh, what are some common things that you might expect to struggle with in this industry that are like kind of this trade, this industry specific that I could pinpoint would be things to watch out for coming into this as they come in? I think for any, and then we're talking about young guys. So Mm -hmm. like if we're talking about guys that are leaving school and, 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 and heading into the industry so these guys most of the time don't have a lot of a lot of skills and especially nowadays i see i see the and there's nothing it's just like i said a generation thing but what needs to happen and they need to switch their their mind on that the older guys only give you so many only only so many chances and 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 you know hey come and help or come and do this and so you need to show a little bit of initiative so, so you know anyone can basically dig a hole you know so if you see an old dude on the shovel or an or a lineman on the shovel ask him hey look oh, i'll take that shovel you might have, you know nine times out of ten that old guy doesn't want to give it up because it's like no no no, i yeah, can do it crutch <laughs> i don't give up because that leads into other stuff if you can show that you that you um that you did one don't give up but that you've got a willingness to to learn and more importantly, work. These guys will, will will give you the world, you know, in return. But if you sit back and you're on your phone and doing whatever, and you don't show real interest, you got to remember these guys aren't paid to train you. 
you know. Yeah, good so they're given something that they've had to earn uh, for free, you know, and and that quality of that training is going to be, it's all going to depend on you sometimes. So if you if you put the hard yards in and, and you show your willingness, and, and like I said, it can be something simple. Like it could be something simple as like the truck rolls into the depot or wherever you work, and you, without the foreman asking, without the lineman asking, you just start cleaning. Take the rubbish off, put the stuff in the bin, start wiping down the dash on the on the front of the truck, and that gets noticed. It 100% gets noticed. So this is a good dude, you know, he's worth putting some effort in and stuff in, you know. Mm. Um, you know, I, I always look, there's two types of guys. It's, you know, there's there's the, the the guys who who the physical hands-on work comes to them easy, the climbing all that bit. Sometimes you don't have to show these guys that, that it comes to them, but they struggle with the academic part of it. They struggle with the electrical theory. They struggle with the written stuff, you know. And then there's the complete opposite, you know. Um, so you, you sort of, you know, sometimes you have people that sort of fall in between, but don't get too hung up. Like I, I, I am a trainer. I was a trainer. Um, don't think that a trainer or a person that's trying to show you is there to 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 fail to fail you. You know, mm-hmm. they're there to to a good trainer. They're there to help you and help you pass through your course and and hopefully give you the right tools and and figure out where where your weaknesses are and maybe you know hey have you tried this or do this or whatever you know that's that's the good thing yeah I love that I love the I love those two things you said. Um, was uh they're not paid to train you and that's important to to remember that they're they're not paid to train you because that's fact unless they're an instructor (laughs) they're not paid to train you and then the quality of your training or the quality of the training you receive depends on how much effort and work you put in that's putting the responsibility on you i don't think that a lot of people realize that and i I love that That that's a that's a great statement because it does hundred yeah. percent. I, I will, like you just said, I would way rather invest in that hardworking kid, that one that's showing me yeah. determination, hard work, even if they're not the sharpest tool in the tread, they're sharpest tool in the shed. Like I'm willing to put in the work if they're willing to put in the work. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Hmm. I've seen. Cool buddy. Um, I've got a few, I've got a few like, kind of quick one-off closing sen- uh, questions, like finish my sentence type questions. Um, is there anything else before we jump into that? Anything else that was burning on your heart to chat about? Um, no, nah, nah, well, y- yes and no. If, if anyone's listening, if any guys in the States and in, in Canada, mate, if you're thinking about taking a bit of a gap year, if you're thinking about, um, you know, what, what would it be like working in New Zealand or, or even Australia, you know, there's a lot of job openings now with, with lots of different companies. Um, they help. They help you relocate. They help you with your visas. They help you with your training. You know, yeah, you're not going to become a millionaire working in New Zealand. You know, but for New Zealand standards, you're going to earn good money. You know, that's the big thing. Like I've never seen. I've never come across a, a, an American lineman. Uh, I mean, a Canadian one, uh, and and in New Zealand, but it would be cool to see. Like there's obviously lots, lots of linemen around. And like I said, if, if anyone's ever interested in it, you can message me up, hit me up, um, and, and I can always point in the right direction. It'd be cool to see um some guys coming over here and and, and okay. seeing what this part of the like, you know. I love that. I I think it's like it's one of the greatest parts about our trade and about our industry that we actually have that ability to do that. Like look at I'm a Canadian working in the United States basically. And like visas are covered. Like it's, it's fantastic experience to be able to do something like that. Um, a guy I worked with, uh, Tim, he about 15 years ago went for a year, year and a half to Australia to work. He still talks about it today. Like as one of the best highlights experiences of of his life, just because he got to go to someplace different. Like, and you know, he might make it back to Australia one more time in his life, you know, but it was a, just a fantastic cultural experience, fantastic work experience. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. If anyone out there is interested, 
man, hook, look, look you up and go for it and take that, take that yeah. jump, take that leap. Cause I, I think that's super that's cool. Yeah. 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 Cool dude. Um, all right. Finish my sentence. If I wasn't a lineman, I would be. Oh, that's one. Um, I would potentially be maybe, like, I don't know, police, the police is always sort of, uh, for some reason, has always sort of, has interested me, you know? Interesting. But, yeah, yeah just, I'm just glad I fell into this, you know, and that's really what I did. I fell into it, you know? Is there service yeah. in, in your family? Uh, no, nah, not, not so. My, my brother and my father were both, have both been in the army, so that could be another thing potentially. You know, I've, I've always had an interest in that as well. Um, but police, you know, like helping out the community and all that sort of stuff. That, um, cool. Yeah, that's quite cool, you know. Yeah. Awesome. What's the most valuable tool in alignment's kit? Oh, a pair of pliers. Oh. Is there anything with a pair of pliers? Yeah. yeah. True story. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you've got enough, you can, you can strip cable, you can crimp cable, you can do everything, man. Everything. Yeah. It's a hammer. It's a good hammer. Just yeah. didn't tell them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Favorite favorite part about being a lineman is what? Um, my favorite part is getting to see places that the ordinary person doesn't get to see. So a lot of lines, a lot of networks run across other people's properties and stuff and, and, and take you to some pretty amazing spots sometimes. You know, you think about where, where some of these technology like, towers lines poles and stuff have been have been put you get some amazing views you know the the, the access to get to that site you know it could be four-wheel driving could be on a, a side-by-side could be on a motorbike you know that's a really cool part along with the people that that work in the industry and stuff you know that's yeah. That's, that's yeah i love how different it can be from day to day as well I remember yeah. I was working in a gold mine. It was a big, giant, open pit gold mine here in Canada. We have quite a few of these big open pit gold, gold and copper and mineral mines. And I was yeah. working right down in the belly of this mine. And some of these haul trucks, if people haven't been around them, look them up on Google. Just look up the biggest mining haul truck. They're massive. Like you could stand a full F-350, Ford F-350 crew cab long box up on end and it still isn't even the size of the tires on these things. They're massive. Yeah, so like yeah. these things rolling by you all day long, get to the shop at the end of the day and get a call. Okay, there's a storm on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, how fast can you be on an airplane? We're heading to Connecticut. And yeah. I'm like, oh, let's be there in you know four hours on the plane, you know, eight hours later, you're on the ground on the East coast of the United States. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and then when you say like access to people's properties and stuff, it's amazing. Yeah. Like big storm scenario, you just flick those orange flashy lights on and you got an all access pass into wherever you want to go. Yeah. And yeah. I just, yeah. I don't know. It's so, it's so crazy how different the scenario can be from even day to day. So I love that. That's yeah. cool. Um, if you could change one thing about the industry, what would it be? Um, hmm. it's, it's going to be controversial. Sometimes more, more sensible health and safety rules. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not having a go at health and safety. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for um, bringing people home safe, safely yeah. and, and doing things safely. Um, but I wish that some of the rules were, or that hmm, I wish that there was more, um, say, lineman involvement in, in some of the rules that get written, you know, mm. and 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 a, a bit more thought process on, yeah, this might work for this one particular task, but does this work for a wide range of, of stuff, or this works in the hundred percent perfect world? But does it work in reality? You know, and are we sometimes doing things that introduces introduce other hazards? And is that hazard bigger than the hazard we're actually trying to stop? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen on the job? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I've seen a few 
uh, we call them line trucks, but our, our crane trucks basically that have the, the hydraulic cranes and all that. Yeah. I've seen a couple of them roll, roll over. I've seen them, I've seen them, uh, basically, uh, uncontrollably roll down, uh, hills and stuff. And luckily all those guys that have been involved in that stuff, they've always been, been all right, you know, so you know, that's, that's good. But there was this one particular time. Uh, was was one of these line trucks, and I always remember it because it was me and a another guy who who I used to idolise as a lineman, you know. And we're up this pole. We call them H structures, but they're like a, a two pole structure with a with a big uh, yep. cross arm across it. And I think we we're getting ready to change the arms or something. I can't quite remember. And about two or three poles over, there was a young line mechanic. Uh, it was a big ridge. And he was trying to sort of get the line truck through the set of gates. And he was sort of doing like, you know, like an Austin Powers type <laughs> of turning scenario. And he reversed a little bit too much. And it was a wet day. And, and he went 200 meters down the down the hill in reverse. And I remember that happening and the, and the noise and stuff. And, and me and this dude looked at each other and go, oh, man, this dude's going to, you know, what, what's going to, you know. Because we couldn't see where it, where it stopped. Yeah. And. Everyone takes all the, you know, goes running down the hill. And luckily enough, it, it, there was this giant boulder and he smashed into that because if he, had, if he hadn't have done that, it, there was another, I don't know, K said he would have gone down the hill and it would have started rolling and, and all that sort of stuff. But luckily he was fine. He had a couple of scratches because with the impact of the truck smashing into the boulder, the RT and everything that was up there obviously flew backwards and, and you know, like kind of smashed into him but you know yeah. he was he was safe so that, that was the main part yeah that was that's i mean i've seen a few of those but that particular one always stands out in my life dang dude that's crazy mm. all right mm. one more for you uh the best advice i've ever received as a lineman stay humble nice. always stay humble you know Great and that that that, that got that got, I, I got that told very early on from a good line mechanic, you know, like stay humble because I look at it as a, everyone's got this imaginary timer above their head. Mm -hmm. And if we're making fun of oh, Joe, oh, he, he fucked up because he did this or whatever. You've got a timer of you. It's only going to be time. Your time's going to run out and you're going to do something, you know? So you stay humble. You know, never, never get too overconfident. And, and in speaking in, in my own personal experience at times that I've got, overconfident or too confident in my own skill sets at times and I've done something stupid mm -hmm. and you know done things I shouldn't have done potentially you know so yeah love that that's a good life lesson right there too just stay humble mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. take it yeah well thanks Jimmy I have enjoyed this conversation immensely uh, thanks for coming on the show again and we should really do this more you're a pretty easy dude to talk to Sweet as brother, thanks for um, having me on again. And uh, I just want to let you know that you're doing an amazing job with the podcast. I think it's, um, I think it's really awesome for the industry. You know, it's something to, to also look back on and, and time to come. It may not seem like it now, but you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, these things have all been recorded and, and someone can listen to this stuff, you know, and, and have some sort of audio um history almost of the industry so i think what you're doing is is, is really good and and uh, and that's on a global sense you know like it mm. obviously you'll, you'll have a lot of listeners in, in, the, in the states and, and in canada there's definitely people listening from all over the world yeah appreciate that man yeah. i was uh no do this uh i'm gonna do this little series on that book the american lineman i'm gonna do a, a series of i think social media posts we might make a few short form youtube videos out of it just like going into explaining some of the stories within that book. Yeah. And one of the, one of the cool stories is, um, I think it's one of the first live line tools in North America is, was, it was called the Mount Whitney tap. And it was for a, mm -hmm. a, a gold mine in California. And they would take that, take an insulator, a car, uh, an insulator on a wooden cob pin. And they would just like tie yep. that into the jumper. Right. And the lineman would just climb the pole, grab that wooden cob pin and undo the tap. And I just think that was the first yeah. live line tool. And I want to do stories like that. So how, like you just said, I, I, I also think it's pretty cool. how you know, whatever form a line worker is in a hundred years from now, is it going to have yeah. some, you know, 
history to like go back and listen to these stories you know people did things in different parts of the world and i, I don't know it's it is pretty cool so thank you i appreciate that yeah. no good I, I love that book too i've got that book the american lineman and i know exactly um the bit you're talking about you know so yeah. and I, i'm the same i where we are now in the industry is is that the guys who started this so those guys who were wearing the suits and the hats and you know you see those old photos and they're sort of like yeah wow they're wearing that but they were the pioneers it's not like go to chance company or, or hastings company or give me this tool it didn't exist they had to make that tool and, and yeah. from there it's rest you know yeah yeah i just think even think of uh, so many stories in that book that I, i'm actually excited to talk about them because you think about changing the first arc lamps um they had to do the they had to do that they had to change the lamp energized and so they would just yeah. on a pulley let that arc lamp down to the ground and then they just stand on a wooden stool and undo this electrified arc right. lamp. and i just yeah. yeah like you said they had no hastings or chance or you know tested you know million volt tested live line tools here yeah. like they just standing on a wooden stool like dude yeah. I don't know it's pretty crazy anyway we'll save that thanks Jimmy alright guys hope you enjoyed that episode with Jimmy like I said I love talking to the guy it's my second episode with Jimmy um, if you liked that one I highly suggest you go back and listen to the first episode you get Jimmy's full story one of the things from this episode that I wanted to highlight to you guys was the open invitation to work in New Zealand like come on if you've thought about traveling the world, you've thought about going somewhere else and doing this job somewhere else in the world, I uh, highly suggest, again, that you make contact with Jimmy. He goes by New Zealand Lineman on Instagram. Shoot him a DM. He's active in the DMs. He's active on Instagram. Shoot him a DM. Get involved. If you want to get to New Zealand, he's going to help connect you with the right guys. Highly suggest that. All right. Like follow all the good things to this episode please it makes a huge difference make sure make sure you're subscribed to the youtube channel to spotify wherever you're listening to this on love you guys stay safe peace